All right, this is chapter seven, um, muscle strength and endurance, although you, with this picture you probably didn't need the words there to describe what this chapter was in regards to. However, this is usually not the patient population we're working with. Um, so anyway, I just thought it was an interesting picture. So the beginning of your notes here, <coughs> um, it starts with um, a little story that um, was written by Dr. Beth Jernberg from University of Sioux Falls. And um, I have permission to, to use this story, but it was she made this in order to help remember what really happens during a muscular contraction. So you can read through this. Um, I won't be asking questions on an exam about this, but it might be helpful as we go through the chapter to kind of remember um, what's taking place at a microscopic level. The um, next several pictures um, relate to that in case you forget what some of these structures are. Um, if you forget what the sarcoplasm is, um, we have a little bit of picture there. Um, again, a picture of the motor units. So we have one nerve that connects to um, anywhere from one muscle fiber to thousands of muscle fibers. And that's considered, um, that's what we call a motor unit. Um, here's a real microscopic picture uh, reminding you again um, what a sarco sarcomere is, um, the cross bridges, the overlapping of the actin and the myosin. Um, that might make the story um, become more, uh, you might recognize these factors and then you can understand the story again. I don't know, if you're taking exercise phys or have to memorize this, it might help with that as well. So. You can kind of page through these as you read the story and use them as needed. All right, today we're going to start with this case study. Um, this will be asked again at the end of lecture, and I'm asking you to email me um, your response to this question um, for up to five points of credit. I'm not really looking for um, an exact specific answer, whether you get five points or not, but rather I'm looking for a thought process and just some ideas that you might have. Um, you can apply some of the information that we're going to learn in this section. So John is four days status um, post an ACL reconstruction surgery and is unable to perform a supine SLR. Hopefully you remember that uh, stands for straight leg raise. The question is how can you modify this activity to strengthen the quadriceps, spelled incorrectly, uh, and re-educate the neuromuscular system to assist this patient in performing the exercise. So they, uh, John can't do a straight leg raise. Um, I don't want you to change um, the actual exercise. I want it to continue to be a supine straight leg raise, um, and we're going to work with um, trying to recruit so that we get an actual isotonic um, contraction of this. And so I'd, I'd prefer that you don't change the exercise um, actually to become isometric or something like that. Um, but just ponder this as we go through the slides, and um, this is actually a case, a real-life case study, and this probably will take place if you end up working with post-op ACLs. Uh, they can't uh, do the straight leg right after surgery, so how can we help this? Um, <clears throat> this next slide, uh, the book has a lot of material. I'm trying to give you some points to remember that um, I've pulled out that I think are most significant. Um, these include that some muscles are slow twitch, that, again, those are type 1 aerobic activity, red, um, sometimes they're called tonic or postural function muscles. Um, it, it's an interesting thing, though, that they respond to dysfunction um, with hypertonicity or shortening. So um, if we have dysfunction of the soleus, or the biceps femoris, the gastrox, the quads, um, all those muscles tend to... Um, trend towards a hypertonicity um, when we have dysfunction or a shortening of those muscles. Um, we don't often see um, calves or gastroc soleus complexes that are too flexible. Um, they usually are the ones that are shortened. We don't see um, hamstrings that um, are too flexible unless somebody's really been working on them, um, a gymnast or somebody in dance. Um, the opposite, or the uh, counterpart to that then, is a fast twitch muscle, which is type 2 anaerobic, um, white. Um, 
fibers and um, an example of these would be um, specifically like we see a lot of this in the glute max and glute med these are phasic muscles they respond to dysfunction with weakness or hypotonicity it's very common to work with a patient that has um, hypotonic or weak glutes um, just over with inactivity <clears throat> so you'll start to see these trends as you work more and more with with patients uh, characteristics of a muscle, uh, these are written down in your, your notes, uh, so we'll just fill in the blanks here. Extensibility and elasticity, um, if a muscle is inactive it becomes stiff, happens with all muscles. Um, stretches are more effective after an active warm-up, so if you end up working with groups of athletes and they want to know when they should stretch and um, when they should do their dynamic stretch would be after they've warmed it up so they've jogged a few laps and then do their dynamic stretches. Um, number two, um, a characteristic is contracture. Um, this is a contracture is when um, a muscle actually fails to uh, relax and so um, over time if it continues to have this we'll actually have a shortening of the entire muscle length and it will um, not allow the range of motion to be full um, over the joint that that muscle crosses. So we can see a contracture of a biceps occasionally if they've been casted or they haven't um, gone into extension of that elbow for a long period of time. And the, ap the um, over time the muscle actually shortens and we can't get full extension of the elbow. So contracture, muscles can actually go into contracture. And then third, muscles can fatigue. And we know that fast twitch muscle contraction can produce a lactic acid. Um, at a higher rate than a slow twitch um, muscle fiber and there is the factor of fatigue um, along with that. Uh, a few more definitions. I think we've already gone through these in class um, but you can write them down in your notes. Muscle strength is a maximal force um, that a muscle can exert for its power, its strength over a distance for a specific time and then endurance, the ability to prolong that activity. When we're training for muscular endurance we're at a sub-max level um, usually, and we don't have to train for just one of these components, we can mix them up um, and train for more than one. Um, this slide shows the relationship between muscle strength and endurance, so if we're working primarily on developing strength on the left side of the graph, we're going to tend to use um, higher um, weights and lower repetitions in order to develop strength. Um, and we won't get as many endurance gains. However, if we go clear to the right side of the continuum um, and work with higher reps and lower weights, we tend to train the muscle for endurance and we'll get lower strength gains than um, if we were on the other end of the continuum. Both are being improved it's just that one can be emphasized more which is nice depending on the repetitions. So if we're working on strengthening um, we're going to be closer um, to that one rep max maybe um, around the 90 percent of the one rep max and we're looking for low reps like around three. Um, if we go to the other end we have um, endurance which is a low intensity 75, 70 percent of a one rep max and higher reps which would be um, about 20, 25. Um, oftentimes we're kind of in the middle um, working at 70 to 90 percent of the one rep max and so we're looking at reps between 6 and 12 in that area. So and generally it's um, two to three sets of an exercise or strengthening is recommended for optimal gains. So uh, to gain strength uh, remember we need to be at 60 at greater than 66 percent of um, a muscle's max. So uh, if you can find out what the 1RM is um, and we're going to get some strength gains, we have to be above 66% of that 1RM or we're not going to really have many gains. So it doesn't matter if you bend your elbow 500 times a day, you're not going to get um, significantly stronger unless we overload that muscle so that it's at 66% of the 1RM. Um, I guess I moved ahead a little bit. There's a section on your notes on recovery after fatigue. So if we're working a muscle and we're actually able to get to fatigue with these types of contractions, we um, should give them some recovery time. So if we're having an, our patient do isometrics um, and they're going to a maximum isometric contraction, um, it's recommended that 60 seconds of recovery is allowed after each set. 
if the athlete um, or patient is working um, with isotonic exercises and they're going to their maximum um, repetitions and um, it's recommended then that we have 30 to 60 seconds of recovery for each set. So we're looking at more of um, a one-to-one -one work to rest ratio um, with isotonics um, as far as how much rest we give them. And then when we're doing isokinetics, and um, this requires a special machine which maintains the speed of contraction, um, and the athlete, if we're able to recruit a maximum output on that, then the athlete's going to need two to four minutes of recovery after each set. Um, we don't typically have to give that much time in rehab for recovery because we aren't pushing athletes to their maximum um, amount, so we don't need a maximum recovery time. But those are stated in case um, you start getting close to that with your, with your athletes. So moving on to the types of muscle activity, we'll talk first about static muscle activity. So we don't have any joint movement um, with static muscle activity. The first one, or really the only thing under this category, is an isometric. Iso means same length. Um, so the length of our um, muscle doesn't significantly change. The range of motion of the joint um, also does not change. So tension is produced in the muscle without a change in its length. Um, if you have seen an athlete or request an athlete to do what we call a setting exercise, S-E-T-T-I-N-G, they set the muscle like a quad set, hamstring set, abdominal set. Those are considered isometrics. So you just simply contract it. We don't want any um, movement of the joint that that muscle crosses. It's just contraction um, of the muscle. Um, the advantages are listed there in your notes. You can pause this if you want to at this point and read through those, um, as well as the disadvantage. You will be required on an exam to be able to list a couple of advantages and disadvantages of the isometrics. Um, fatigue factor with isometrics. It's interesting that after five seconds of an isometric hold, um, muscle tension is reduced uh, to 75% by 10 seconds. So you can see on this graph when we get time over here to uh, 10 seconds that the strength is decreased. Um, even on this graph you see it's below 75 um, percent. And then strength is actually reduced to, um, or I guess at five seconds we're decreased to 75 percent of the original strength. And if we continue to hold that isometric for 10 seconds, its relative tension is down to 50% of its maximal isometric force. So this is where they actually come up with the time um, for holding an isometric. And it's recommended that an isometric is held for six seconds. So um, at six seconds, then um, we're just probably at or below 75% of the maximum isometric. After that, we aren't getting any significant gains. So go ahead and let them rest. Um, for optimal strength gains to occur, again, we're stating that the muscle effort has to be between 66 and 100% of its maximum output. Um, if we are at 20% to 35% of maximum output, um, we're maintaining strength only, which is not necessarily bad. Um, there's going to be some conditions um, or some populations with, I'm thinking of the elderly populations, <clears throat> that we may only, at best, we may be able to maintain strength. Um, so at least we're not letting it lower, um, and so that can be significant for us. Uh, rate of strength loss is much quicker than the rate of strength gain. You can lose 5% um, of your strength a day. Of course, that depends on how much strength you've got to start out with. Um, and what you lose in one day may take weeks to regain. So that just underscores, again, the importance of um, not doing a lot of um, immobilization of joints um, when people are recovering. And I think that might be the star that I have um, under there. Oh, I wrote it in for you. So um, <clears throat> you can maybe write in the margins that um, even if somebody is immobilized for a period of time, we need to start doing some type of the strengthening. So oftentimes isometrics are used for this. So the next category is isotonics, and that comes under the category of dynamic strengthening. Isotonics, then, um, iso means 
tone or same and then tone is tonic so a change in the muscle length occurs but the um, during the activity but the resistance remains the same um, if we look at the picture with the weights we could see the resistance does stay the same that weight doesn't change um, during the range of motion however this is a reminder that when you use TheraBand this is not truly an isotonic exercise because that TheraBand does the resistance changes so when he's pulling um, the TheraBand up here it is of a harder resistance than when the TheraBand um, is down in this range so remember that if you want truly isotonic and um, we will want that in certain situations such as rotator cuff um, pulse stop rehab that um, we may want to veer away from TheraBand because of the changing uh, resistance on this. Um, <clears throat> a, I put concentric, um, and then B, we have eccentric. So we have two phases of an isotonic contraction. The concentric is the muscle shortening. The eccentric is the muscle lengthening. But the, remember that the muscle still is contracting, um, even though it's lengthening or shortening. We still have a contraction going on. So examples of this, these types of um, weights, it's what you guys have seen, free weightlifting, machine lifting, um, manual resistance, um, there's something called PREs, which is progressive resistance exercise, um, those all come under the category of isotonics. Um, when we're performing um, isotonics, <clears throat> it's important to remember that the eccentric activities will produce about 30% more force um, than the concentric. Um, and that's because of the aid of non-contractile elements. Um, we can also remember that um, eccentric activities cause more delayed onset of muscle soreness. So we might want to start these later in rehab if we're doing some intense eccentrics. Um, and a little soreness um, in like phase three is certainly okay if it's soreness of um, the muscle and not the joint if the joint was involved. Um, oh, there we got a picture of the biceps with contraction um, isotonically, a concentric contraction when it shortens, and an eccentric contraction when it's lengthening. Sometimes this is called the positive part of a lift with the concentric, and the negative part of the lift is the eccentric. And oh, we have an overload on um, the eccentric here. This is probably just a slide to wake you up here. Um, Further down, it gives again the advantages and disadvantages on your notes um, of isotonics, so make sure that you read through those um, and that you're able to um, list out a few of the advantages and disadvantages of isotonic exercises. All right, isokinetics um, is kind of the last main type of strengthening exercise we're going to talk about. This falls under. Typically, we're doing um, dynamic motions on the isokinetic machine. So iso, same, and kinetic meaning speed. So the speed is controlled. You can't go faster than what is um, inputted on the machine. Um, <clears throat> but the resistance changes. So we have an accommodating resistance. So speed is the same. The amount of resistance varies throughout the range of motion. Um, so it's accommodating. So if you think about when you do a bicep curl, um, when you start lifting the bicep, curl and your arm is more extended, um, it, you won't be probably able to lift quite as much. The greater you get to a 90 degree angle, you can lift a little bit more. And then you get beyond that. And um, again, we get go back to where we can't lift quite as much. So um, it'd be like if you were doing a bicep curl, the isokinetic machine constantly changes the weight that you are lifting to accommodate um, your maximum output. So your push as hard and as fast as you can and the machine pushes back um, as hard as it can um, but it maintains your speed. So you can't go any faster um, than what the machine is set at. Now you can go slower but you won't be able to give your maximum output. So somebody can fake these machines out but again they're, it's not going to be very productive for them. Um, some of the advantages for isokinetics um, accommodating resistance provides maximum resistance throughout the range of motion. We just spoke about that. Um, we can work at more functional speeds, although um, some of these machines only go up to about 360 degrees per second um, for a speed. And if you look at sports or athletic activities, um, oftentimes they're in the thousands of degrees um, per second of movement. So. Um, 
we aren't getting up even close probably to functional, but certainly it's much faster than if we're doing isotonics. Another advantage is that we can isolate weak muscle groups um, and work those so that the powerful ones don't take over just in order to lift the weight as they would with isotonics. There's inherent safety mechanism um, within the machine. So um, if you have pain um, for some reason through a particular arc of movement, so let's say you're doing seated knee extensions and you have pain at about 40 degrees of extension and um, you, your knee kind of gives and you aren't able to lift the weight, the machine takes the resistance off. So when it feels your pressure come off and you aren't pushing anymore, it accommodates that resistance um, and will decrease it. So it's you are pretty safe using the isokinetic machines. And then you're able to quantify work, power, and torque. And these are values that we'll look at here in a little bit. Uh, you get a printout from this machine. It's all computerized. And you're able to compare right to left. And you get very specific numbers um, that help to indicate um, perhaps whether an athlete is ready to go back to sport in relationship um, to strength anyway. <clears throat> a disadvantage. Um, these machines are working primarily in open chain exercises, and we will talk about those later. But if you want to think of right now open chain um, in the legs as being um, non-weight bearing, and of course most of our athletic activities are in closed chain, we're in weight bearing activities, so they aren't as functional as we would like. Um, they're limited to isolated muscle groups, so we can work on maybe strengthening the rotator cuff in a particular motion, but to actually take an arm and make and have it strengthened through a diagonal pattern that might take place when you're throwing a baseball, um, that's much more difficult to take place um, on an isokinetic machine. Uh, whereas you could take and, and do strengthening with pulleys um, in a diagonal um, using the isotonics. It's limited to cardinal planes of motion, and like I, that's just kind of what it, I said. Um, and we don't do sports activities in cardinal planes of motion. Um, they are, have been working and perhaps have already developed this, but I know that they were, at the U of M they were working on an isokinetic machine that would work in diagonal patterns, which were much more functional. Um, the equipment is very expensive. Um, it's um, a large machine. It takes up a lot of space. Uh, it requires some education to know how to work each different kind of machine. So there's Biodex and Kincoms, and these are all sorts of different um, isokinetic machines. That everyone runs a little bit different. Um, they have to be maintained, so you have to have somebody come out on at least an annual basis and, and maintain or um, calibrate the machines. Um, which is part of why we ended up getting rid of ours. It had they needed so much maintenance and then also our accrediting body said that we didn't have to teach um, actually hooking um, an athlete up to isokinetic machines and utilizing it we just have to teach about and what is an isokinetic machine um, <clears throat> so as we move on that's advantages and disadvantages um, Here's a picture of somebody that's hooked up to the isokinetic machine, and they're going to be doing a knee extension. You can see how it's done just in a cardinal plane. It's not very functional. It's an open chain. Um, he's got to be secured down um, pretty well. Got electrodes on him on this one, so they're, they're doing a couple different measurements of output. But that's what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> I think on the previous slide, let's go back there. On the previous slide, um, if you click on this link, I might have, I think it's a video you can see of an isokinetic actually taking place. Um, so I think it's a good idea if you can do that, go ahead and click on that link um, and watch the video for it's just a couple minutes long and you can see what it looks like when an isokinetic is done. So. Um, if you didn't get the advantages written down, I I didn't realize I had them written on a slide for you. So there they are. You can write those down, either stop the video or just review. Um, there's the disadvantages that are written down. Um, all right, moving on to output interpretation. Uh, so like I said, there's some things that we'll evaluate on isokinetics that are important. Um, that physicians might want to see or that we want to know. Um, and there's three here that I've listed that um, we would look at most often. 
The first um, one that we're going to look at, we get its output on paper, and it's got all sorts of numbers on it. And one of those numbers is the peak torque. And so that's how much force, and let's just kind of, let's think about the example of the knee extension that the guy was strapped up into on the isokinetic machine. So peak torque um, would be how much force he could produce um, at his highest rep. What was it at his highest rep? And then the machine will also be able to average those out. So um, one number that we would look at is the peak to average torque ratio. And then we would compare that on the injured side to the uninjured side. And typically we're looking at an 85% or 90%. So the um, injured side is 85 to 90% at least of what the non-injured limb was in order for them to return to play. So that was the one number that we would look at. Um, a second number would be agonist to antagonist ratio. And for the knee, we would often look at this. and We want to know what's the hamstring to quad ratio. And we were oftentimes looking um, at, um, we would want to see a number of 66% or above when we had the speed set at 60 degrees per second. So, um, oh, sorry, I got interrupted there. Um, if you heard a squeal in the background a few slides ago, um, Jamie's next door watching the uh, women's hockey. <laughs> Um, Canada just won, so she's in agony. So, all right, back to this exciting lecture um, on output interpretation. Um, I think we're on number three, eccentric to concentric ratio. Um, so when we're doing knee extension as the knee pushes up, that's our concentric number of our force production, and then it would also record when the weight is coming back down, what's the eccentric. Um, force production. And we're always looking to see that the eccentric force production was greater than the concentric force production, which is natural. Um, an eccentric contraction can produce more force than a concentric contraction. Um, and it tends to get greater um, as the speeds increase. So our eccentric force production is greater as speeds increase. So we would look for that trend to happen. If that wasn't the case, then we would say we need to do some more eccentric training on this athlete. All right, here's an example of a printout. This is what um, it usually looks like. Um, so as the red line goes up, um, we see force production um, change. And then um, as the knee is coming back down, then right. we have our force production decreasing. Um, I believe that the green line is um, a range of motion um, indicator. It's typically what that is, although it doesn't completely match up with what I would typically see. Um, so it might be a different measurement, but that's uh, that red one is what we're really looking for. If you look below the curve um, that is made by this red line, all this space below the curve is what we would call work. So this value here is all the work that was taking place. Um, and if we look at this example, um, we come clear over here to the last repetition, and we can see that the torque was um, at its peak right there because that's the highest curve. And we would look to see what's this um, amount of work that was done. And this is all printed out on the computer, so they would say um, on repetition 7, the um, work was, and then they'd give you a value. And you could see that that would probably be the greatest work value. Um, one thing that is often evaluated on these torque curves of the printout is what's called the total work. So they take a measurement of how much work is performed during all the repetitions. So how much here, here, and all these spaces under here. Um, they put a value on that and compile that. Um, and then we would compare it, of course, to the contralateral side. But this was considered the best overall indicator of readiness um, for return to sport. If, um, if these were equal, um, or certainly we're looking at about 85 to 90 percent of what the in other side is. The other factor that could be looked at is called a fatigue index. Fatigue index is the best measure of muscular endurance that we would see. So we'd start off watching these reps and we'd see, okay, this torque up here is at a 60, and um, we want to know how many reps can this person do before they um, get to a fatigue or their peak torque is down to 30. 
Um, so how many reps can be produced? Um, and I just didn't get on there, but how many reps can produ be produced um, before the peak torque is 50% um, or before the torque reaches 50% of the peak torque at the start? So again, we're starting at 60 here. How many repetitions before the peak torque is only getting at, at 30? Um, and we compare those repetitions to the uninvolved side, and we want those to be very similar, if not the same. Um, so those were tests that we would look at with isokinetics. Um, <clears throat> sometimes we would use the isokinetics for training. Uh, so what we would typically do is start an athlete at 60 degrees per second. That's the speed. And um, they would do 10 repetitions and anywhere from one to three sets at that speed. And then we would give them uh, 60 seconds of rest. And then we would bring it up to 80 degrees. 90 degrees, excuse me, 90 degrees um, per second. So they're going faster, and they would do 10 reps, um, one set, and then they'd get another 60 seconds of rest, and then they'd go up to 120, do the same thing, rest, 150, do the same thing, and 180, and do the same thing. And then they would reverse back down to 150, 150 degrees per second. They'd do 10 repetitions. Um, they'd get a minute rest, and then they'd do 120 degrees per second, 10 repetitions, and then get a minute rest and all the way down. So you, you can imagine they're kind of building this pyramid of speed where they're going up, peaking out at 180 degrees per second, and then coming back down. And so we would call it pyramid training um, with the isokinetics. This was intense training. Um, athletes wanted to get to their maximum contractions. Um, so we only did this, um, usually we were doing this one time a week, not very often. So once a week, um, with this type of training program on isokinetics, and they were doing other exercises on the other days. Um, <clears throat> here's a statement that, that we would um, sometimes look at, and this is the, the trends that we would want to see when we're looking at isokinetics, is that our force production decreases um, with an increase in speed when we're looking at the concentric contractions. Okay, so we look at just concentric contractions, and our force production decreases with an increase in speed. So as we would increase these speeds on our pyramid training up to 180 degrees per second, we would see the force production would actually decrease, um, and mainly because they don't need the, that much force in order to get to move that fast. Um, and then when we're we would look at the eccentric contractions, so lowering the weight back down, we would see that there would be a force production increase with an increase in speed. So as the machine went faster, they would have to lower the machine. Um, in order to keep up that speed, they would have to lower it by producing more force. So here's a phenomena um, with the force velocity curve. We talked about this if you've had biomechanics, um, and we overloaded a muscle after um, we got to an isometric contraction, and the more weight we put on, they couldn't lift it concentrically, they could lower it eccentrically, um, and we could put so much weight on that they would eccentrically contract very quickly. Um, and again, this is demonstrated on the force velocity curve, and I think there's a picture of this um, in your book, um, if you want to review that. this. Um, is a little bit of a hint for your case study, uh, so you might want to review this and um, help you with your case study answer. Um, oh, here's a picture of it. <clears throat> Some of you recognize this. Um, the velocity is in the middle, and of course, as um, our speed increases, the concentric force decreases, and if we go from this direction, as the speed increases, our eccentric um, force increases. So there's a little pictorial of this. All right, and then um, just to clarify the difference between an agonist, and you can write these down, it's the muscle that's considered the principal mover, um, producing the motion and maintaining a posture, also called the prime or primary mover. In this example, she's doing bicep curls, so the um, agonist would be the biceps. Antagonist, um, for strengthening, when we're talking about strengthening, it's the muscle that possesses um, 
that is opposite of the agonist. So um, it passively elongates in order to permit motion to occur. So in this example, when she's doing bicep curls, the triceps are the antagonists. Synergists then are any muscles that contract at the same time. They help the agonist and stabilize the proximal joint so that the motion can occur at the distal joint. Um, this might be any of the muscles to help stabilize at the shoulder so that she can do bicep curls. Um, they also might prevent unwanted motions. For example, pronation um, would be prevented by, um, or supination would be prevented by the pronator teres um, action. Um, so we want to maintain this position so we have to have other muscles that help that and the synergists are what we call those. Last concept to review, and we'll, um, then we'll end with this, is kinetic chain, open kinetic chain, or OKCs. Um, the definition is when the distal segment moves freely in space. So here we've got um, an open chain kinetic exercise for um, knee extension. The foot, which is distal, is moving over the knee, um, and that's considered an open chain. If you use an example in your upper extremities, if you wave at somebody, that's considered open kinetic chain. Um, sometimes people will say this is non-weight bearing positions. Close kinetic chains or CKCs, this is when the distal segment is fixed. Um, so we can see that the foot is fixed and the knee and hips are moving over the fixed segment and that's called closed kinetic chain. Um, oftentimes we're in weight bearing. Um, so an example of this in the upper extremity would be um, if you're doing a push-up. That would be a weight-bearing activity, and that's also closed kinetic chain for the upper extremity. Um, closed kinetic chain um, exercises produce high-velocity motions. Um, they the closed kinetic or open kinetic chains, I'm sorry, produce high-velocity motions. Um, so throwing, of course, is open kinetic. Running is considered open kinetic as well. Closed kinetic chains place less shear joint on the extra stress on the joint, so they're safer to do early in the therapeutic exercise programs. Um, so leg extensions versus knee bends, um, it's, it's more safe to do um, knee bends post-op ACL than it is to do leg extensions. Um, functional activities oftentimes use a combination of both open and closed, and other joints within the chain have to be included in the therapeutic exercise um, programs. So we aren't just working um, the knee, um, we're working a whole chain, which is an advantage. Uh, the function of one joint impacts the function of the other joint within the kinetic chain. So for example, if a person tends to go into a genu valgus and they knock knee really bad, that'll affect um, the joint at the hip joint and how um, biomechanically it works. Um, I think that that should probably wrap it up for this section. Um, so again, the case study, John, is four days status post, ACL um, reconstruction surgery, and I'd like to know um, how you can help him do a supine straight leg raise. Um, I don't want you to change it to an isometric um, or an isokinetic. I want him to do a supine straight leg raise, but he cannot lift his leg um, up to do this. And so um, I just want you to ponder some ways that you might be able to help him. So email your answer for me um, to me before 8 o'clock on Tuesday um, so that you can get up to five um, points of credit. So have a great day. Thanks.